you and Tablas Creek here to Paso? So what brought Tablas Creek here was really the right combination of soils and climate and rainfall. Um, and we're a little different from most California wineries in that most California wineries start with a place and then figure out what they're going to plant. We knew what we wanted to plant and found the place to suit it. And Paso was not at all on our radar screens when we started all of this. Um, if you'd asked my dad and the, the parents where they thought they were going to end up when they started their search for a, a roan spot in California, they would have told you Sonoma. Um, but you can see the rocks that we have that we're sitting on. These are, this is limestone, or at least it's calcareous clay. And this is what we were looking for for soils, and it's really impossible to find this in California outside of the Central Coast. So. That was kind of the first thing that brought us here. The second was we wanted to be in a place that had a warm enough climate to ripen things like Morvedra and Roussan, which ripen really late. Um, and Paso has the, the benefit of these glorious warm summers and all the sun and a really long growing season. But at the same time, the nights are cold enough that the earlier ripening room varieties like Viognier and Syrah don't go flat. So climate was great, soils were great, and the last thing we wanted was enough rainfall to farm without having to irrigate. And you need, you really need 25 inches of rain or so on average to do that reliably. You can get by with 15 and in some years as long as the other years you make it up. But uh, where we are here, the historical average is about 28 inches of rain a year. We're only about 10 miles from the Pacific. We're up in the foothills of the Santa Lucia Mountains. And we get a lot more rain than even the regions a few miles further east from us. Well, talking about rain, we're in a drought right now. I know that you follow all the trends here. You're watching things in the vineyard and keeping track of all the trends. And because this drought's been going for a while now, what kind of trends are you seeing from that? Are, or are there any? So this is the fourth year of drought. Um, I don't think that 2012 played like a drought vintage in California. We've had two wet winters before. The vineyards had so much energy built up particularly here where we'd lost a lot of crop to frost in 2011, and so the vines had kind of worked very hard to ripen things. But really the, the first impacts of the drought we felt in 2013, uh, where our yields were down by about 20% compared to 2012. And this actually isn't a bad thing. It, was, it ended up right in our sweet spot, a little more than two and a half tons an acre across our whole vineyard. And we got great concentration, but the vines were perfectly able to get through harvest and, and stayed healthy all the way through. Um, last year was very similar, um, and this year the vineyard looks honestly better than it has the last couple of years. We got 16 inches of rain this winter, uh, which is a lot for the area, and more than we've gotten the last few years. And so we're we're hopeful that what we'll see at least is is good concentration and and still maintain pretty good health in the vineyard. But everybody's worried: what if this is now normal? Um, and I, I think everyone's trying to figure out what the impact of that are going to be. I know one of the things that we've been doing is we've been planting more and more, and this sounds counterintuitive, but we've been planting more and more dry farmed vineyards in the drought. And you can see again behind me over here, you can see one of our blocks. And this is a, a head trained dry farm vineyard that we've planted farther apart so the vines can be more self-sufficient. Uh, this is done 10 by 10 spacing. So you only have about 380 vines per acre compared to a normal trellised vineyard where you might have 1,600 to 1,800 vines per acre. And the, the fewer holes you poke in the ground, the less water you're pulling out from underground and the more able you are to, you are to keep your vines self-sufficient. So, more sustainable yeah. So we feel like planting with less density um, will mean that we don't have to plant irrigated, which is great because it's really the groundwater that's seeing the most, the most pressure from the ground. Gotcha. So talking about the head pruned, I know that you do, it's Ungoble. 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 Yeah. And then the Roussan, that are head pruned. What else do you do head pruned out here? So, and what pros and cons do you find with the head pruned? So let me talk about what we have first, then I'll talk about, talk about what we're seeing. Um, this vineyard right behind us is more bedroom. This whole, whole block here. Behind that you see the other side of the road there, you can see some Tanat that's head pruned, and then we have Roussan and Quinoise um, further away. And we have a new, a, re a newer vineyard block um, from which the, the base of the Ungoble comes that is designed to be a self-sufficient field blend of Grenache and Morvedra and Syrah and Quinoise. Um, so really, the only grapes that we don't plant head trained right now are Viognier and Marsan. Um, we've had to learn a different way of trellising, or not trellising, but a different way of training Syrah because it doesn't grow as vertically as the others. The others, you can 
plant just to plant a stick and you don't have to train it up very high and the shoots come up vertically. Um, Syrah, the shoots go out horizontally. So if you don't train it up high, all of the fruit trails on the ground. Um, but you can train it up to a tall post and then it comes out almost like a throw. Um, in terms of in terms of the pros and cons of, of farming this way, the pros are that you can make it more sustainable and self-sufficient. Um, it's less work. There's fewer vines to put in the ground. There's less time to have to touch it each year. It naturally regulates its yield better. So you can get two tons an acre um, without having to do much fruit thinning or anything else. The downside is that you can only get about two tons an acre. And um, that's fine for, for most purposes for us. But it's, it's a natural uh, hindrance overall on the adoption of the, of the technique. You're just not going to get big yields off of it. Right. But we're thrilled with the quality, and we get enough quantity off of it. To, it's, and we have a new, a new parcel that we bought uh, four years ago that we're just now starting to develop, and the plan is to develop all 60 of the acres that we have to plant there at training property. That's great.